Hello and welcome to the Robotics MSc Online Open House. I am Noah Town. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. I actually got my PhD in electrical engineering and did a postdoc in, in biology. And so the list of appointments that I have shown there represent this diverse and multidisciplinary background that I've been trained in. I'm also the deputy director of the Laboratory of Computational Sensing and Robotics. And in that uh, vein, I, I run the Robotics MSc uh, graduate program. And I have with me uh, Andrew Dykeman. Hi, I'm Andrew Dykeman. I'm a master's student in my last semester in the robotics program here. I did my undergraduate at Johns Hopkins as well and decided to stay on because of some of the cool stuff going on in the program. Before I talk about our program in particular, I want to take a minute to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Johns Hopkins University in uh, general. Johns Hopkins University is the uh, oldest PhD granting institution in the United States. And for 37 years, uh, JHU has led higher education in research and development, spending a record $2.3 billion in fiscal year 2015. And what this number really means is that uh, Johns Hopkins is an extremely vibrant place for research and education, and uh, that finds its way into all aspects of our academic uh, programs. There are nine divisions, including the Whiting School of Engineering, where robotics sits, but also there's the Applied Physics Lab, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, Bloomberg School of Public Health, Krieger School of Arts and Sciences, among others. These are the big ones. Within the university, as I said, one of the divisions is the Whiting School of Engineering. Uh, the Whiting School of Engineering has nine PhD programs, 14 master's programs, 21 part-time master's programs, and uh, 16 online graduate programs. The robotics MSE in particular, just to understand where that fits, it falls under our uh, in-person, on-campus 14 master's programs. It's one of those 14. Uh, we have 1,600 graduate students, 1,800 undergraduate, and 2,500 part-time graduate students, and a really large uh, faculty for such an overall small place. We have 181 academic and 31 research uh, faculty, and that may not seem like uh, a lot, but uh, it's all very nicely concentrated right here at the Homewood campus, which means that you have access to interact with uh, a really diverse range of faculty right here on campus. There are 32 teaching faculty. These are full-time faculty that are uh, fully engaged on, a, uh, on an independent career path, independent from the research faculty, but very much a part of our, our, our program and our graduate and undergraduate education, and 43 associated research scientists and engineers. The Robotics Center, it's really a center, not a department, uh, the distinction is minor. The Robotics Center, also known more uh, elaborately as the Laboratory for Computational Sensing Robotics, uh, was founded by the School of Engineering in 2007, but the history dates much further back than that. Robotics was really founded at Johns Hopkins in 1992 with the hiring of our first robotics faculty member of Greg Trichian. Shortly thereafter, we hired uh, eminent scholars Lewis Whitcomb and Russ Taylor. Russ Taylor is uh, well known as one of the founders of the field of medical robotics, which is one of the great strengths in Johns Hopkins. And then shortly after those two came to the program, robotics really took off at Hopkins. And by 1998, we had founded the Engineering Research Center, approximately 30 to $50 million National Science Foundation funded research uh, center that allowed us not only to grow our research, but also grow uh, our faculty and ultimately we established presence in Ackerman Hall, uh, bringing the robotics faculty from all over campus into, under one roof. We have 22 engineering faculty, about 10 postdocs. We're now um, hitting a record 60 master's students in our program and uh, approximately uh, 60 uh, PhD students as well. Um, and our collaborations are all over the world. We're starting close to home. We have ongoing collaborations with the Applied Physics Laboratory. In fact, one of our resident uh, faculty members is actually has his primary appointment in the Applied Physics Laboratory and has a laboratory here on campus. Similarly with the School of Medicine, we have faculty who have their primary appointments in the School of Medicine but have laboratories here. Um, and then we have strong academic collaborations with uh, many universities as you see listed there and equally strong collaborations with a number of premier industrial partners, especially in the uh, medical industry. Now more specifically about the master's program that uh, you're considering applying to and that I'm talking to you about today. The robotics master's degree actually began taking form in the early 2000s and we matriculated our first class in 2013. Uh, I mentioned we're up to um, 60 students now, many of whom, uh, and, and not to mention many who have already graduated uh, and gone on to even bigger uh, things. I won't say better things because it's a pretty good program, but they've gone on to bigger things. Uh, all of our students 
that are in the master's program take eight courses. That includes two core courses. And then they also take selected courses to fulfill one of the six tracks that I'll tell you about in a minute. It's a really important part of our program and how we help provide some structure to your learning experience. At least four of these courses of these eight have to be at the advanced uh, graduate level. And then there are two other options. The default option, I would say, is uh, to take two more advanced graduate student courses. And if you apply and are admitted to the program, you will be admitted to the coursework based masters. But many of our graduate students after matriculation and engagement in the program get involved in research. And one way to really put a, a capstone on your master's education is to complete a research essay. You can get involved in research without doing an essay. There's lots of opportunities for research on, on campus. In fact, a significant minority, if not a majority of our master's students at least get involved in a research laboratory at some point during their stay here. And then uh, a subset of those go on to complete a, a master's essay. And the timeline to complete the degree, depending on uh, a number of factors, is one and a half to two years. It's very reasonable to plan to finish the program in one and a half years. Um, some students end up taking one extra semester part-time to complete their final course. And um, it is, I would say, to be very clear up front, it is not really possible to try to complete this program in just one year. We, I get that question a lot, and it would require you to take five courses a semester for two semesters, which would crush just about anybody, and is not really the intent of the program. The intent of the program is to provide an immersive and extensive master's experience, um, and it just can't be a sort of uh, rushed down your throat in, in one year. So it's really a one and a half to two year program. I mentioned that several of the courses that you will take will be selected from one of six tracks. So we have uh, tracks in automation science and engineering, biorobotics, control and dynamical systems, medical robotics, perception and cognitive systems, and then a track that we call general robotics, which allows you to get a really broad and diverse uh, background if you choose to be less specialized. The newest of these tracks is the biorobotics track. That's uh, one I helped to architect, but all these tracks are, are really interesting and I highly recommend that you spend some time and peruse our um, graduate handbook uh, or advising manual, which is easily found on the uh, LCSR website. And you can read about these tracks and look at the course listings for these individual tracks. Uh, and then you can take the step a little bit further and track down the course descriptions on our student information system website and really kind of read and understand what it is you'd be learning in one of these tracks. Obviously, you won't be able to understand it completely, which is the reason you would come and get a master's degree, but you can get a, a better sense of, of what the program is all about. In fact, many of the courses have publicly accessible websites where you can actually download and, and look at some of the materials. One of our flagship courses, Robot System Programming, makes everything available uh, online. So you can even uh, begin to do some of the projects before you even come to campus if you were so ambitious. This webinar is about the robotics master's degree, but it would be incomplete not to explain the scholarly context in which that master's program sits. We really think about the master's program as being synergistic with our, our research. And so uh, just to give you a very, very brief overview of the research that's happening in the LCSR, we have uh, medical robotics, I think is uh, one field in which we are considered by most in the field to be the preeminent institution, uh, but we also have preeminent research in a number of other areas, including robotics and extreme environments. This includes both medical robotics, which, in, which is an extreme environment, but also space and deep sea underwater navigation. Those are obviously very extreme environments. Human machine collaborative systems and neuromechanics and bio-inspired robotics. I'll tell you a little bit about my work in that area. And the important thing to understand here is that these things are often very linked. When studying medical robotics, we can often draw inspiration for building new medical devices. We can often draw inspiration from biology. That's something that I've done in my career, for example. But in addition, Human machine collaborative systems can be both for manufacturing or for medical robotics. In fact, the very famous Da Vinci surgical system, which we do primary research and development on here at Johns Hopkins, is a human machine collaborative robot that is used for medical robotics. Um, so all of these systems are not living in their own little fiefdom, but are actually highly connected. And most of the faculty work in multiple of these areas. So a little bit about my research in particular. I mentioned that I'm a, double E, an electrical engineer, 
who is in a mechanical engineering department studying biology. So that seems like a strange and eclectic mix of things, but my background and interest has always been in understanding how things move. So what makes me want to get up in the morning and go to work is to try to understand both the biological underpinnings and the dynamic controls and robotics underpinnings of movement and its control. And so I'm focusing here on this slide on three of the specific systems that I've looked at in my lab. The first one, the one that actually got me involved in biological research, the one that I started with my postdoc advisor, Bob Full at UC Berkeley, is uh, cockroach-inspired tactile sensing. It actually started as a basic science inquiry into how biological antennae work. And so what you see here on the left is a schematic view of a cockroach running along a wall, and you can see its antenna is deflected by this, um, in this drawing, the antenna is being deflected by a perturbation to the uh, wall distance. And what's interesting about a cockroach antenna, well, there's many things that are interesting, but one of the interesting things is unlike a whisker, like on a rat, a cockroach antenna has nerves in it. So it's a highly sensorized device that has contact, strain, chemo sensing, and temperature sensing all along its length. And it can use that during navigation and control behaviors. And so here, uh, is a schematic of a cockroach uh, running along the wall, but these animals are nocturnal, so they can do this in complete darkness and can run something like 20 or 30 body lengths a second in complete darkness without running into a wall, which would be something like running down the hallway with your eyes closed, using a long stick to feel your way along the wall. And I guarantee that that wouldn't end well, so I don't recommend trying it, but the cockroach, that seems to be their superpower. They're really good at this. And so they're good at this for reasons that we spent some time investigating on the neural control side, but they're also good at it because their antenna is so smartly designed. And so I'm gonna show here a video of a robotic antenna demonstrating one of the key principles that we've discovered in the cockroach antenna, which is that what you notice in this picture, and I'm not sure if you can see my mouse moving on the screen, but what you notice on this picture is that the cockroach antenna is curved backwards. And it turns out, we didn't realize this at first when we were studying the animal, but this is a critical component of how the antenna functions. And it turns out that it's not so obvious how to design an antenna so that it would very quickly develop this posture. And what we discovered is that all along the length of the antenna, not shown in this picture, but you can see on our robotic antenna down here, there are little tiny spines that engage in the substrate. And so that as the cockroach is running along the wall, and here you'll see our, our robot antenna running along the wall, and the inset is the cockroach antenna, it engages that surface. And within one stride, the cockroach antenna turns around by, this, by these distally pointing spines, creating a kind of anisotropic friction. So that was the first system that I studied. Uh, more briefly, another system that I got to study when I was in on my sabbatical visiting a biology lab at University of Washington was the uh, hawk moth, Manduca sexta. And what you see in this video, what you'll see in this video is here the hawk moth is, it's actually glued to a stick and presented with a visual stimulus. These black stripes will represent the visual stimulus moving up and down. And as that visual stimulus moves up and down, you will notice that the abdominal angle changes in a way that's highly correlated with the visual stimulus. And what we hypothesized that this mechanism is for, it was long known that insects had a visual motor response to their abdomen. What was not known was why. And so uh, what I hypothesized and worked out with uh, a very bright postdoc in Tom Daniels lab was that that visual motor response is it can actually be used to help the animal dynamically balanced as it's flying. And so we tested this principle, and you can read all about this in a nice uh, paper in Journal of Experimental Biology. We tested this on a quadcopter, uh, which is shown here. And here you see a very sophisticated perturbation device, really just a guy with a stick. Uh, and he's gonna whack this thing. And there is with our abdominal controller turned off. And now we're gonna show the abdominal control turned on and we can stabilize flight in the way that we think that the hawk moth is, is operating. And the value of this, we think, is in um, designing quad rotors to be more agile. As they go to pick up a payload, they're not going we don't need to build a robot with an abdomen, but we can build a flying robot that has a gripper that picks up a large heavy object and then use the ability to manipulate that object to enhance flight control. And then lastly, I don't have a video for this, uh, but lastly, um, we've studied the swimming control of this animal, the glass knife fish. We've done this both by instantiating principles of this swimming uh, fish in a swimming robot and analyzing it computationally as well. 
uh, and discovered very interesting principles of stability and maneuverability in uh, these fish. So in short, we examine these biological systems using math modeling, robotics, control systems theory, uh, as well as uh, experimental biology, and then, and then that allows us to discover and apply principles of locomotion sensing and cognition uh, to robotic systems. Uh, and now I want to hand things over to my collaborator in this talk, Andrew Dykeman, to talk about um, the student experience at Johns Hopkins. Hi guys, so as I mentioned before, I've actually been at Hopkins for uh, quite a while, just over five years now, because I did my undergrad here. Uh, my undergraduate work was in computer engineering, and I joined the robotics program because there was some really interesting stuff going on in artificial intelligence and machine perception that I wanted to continue studying and working with here. So I went into the perception track, and I can talk specifically about some of the interesting courses that I did in that. But I will say that I have friends who did all of the different tracks, and so there's a lot to go on in all of the things that you can do. Um, so I focused a lot on machine learning and computer vision with a, a bit of artificial intelligence and deep learning. And what I found was that in all of the courses, especially the ones that are made for the robotics program, there's a wealth of projects that you can do just inside of the classroom. Most classes have a final project that allows you to do, I mean, I made a, a self-driving car driven by a neural network for Lewis Whitcomb's class, Robot Systems Programming, which was mentioned earlier. We made an intelligent swarm that could rearrange into multiple formations. Uh, I have friends who made a working chess playing robot. There's just really no limit to what you can do, and there's tons of robots and machinery and computers to support you doing that. On top of that, Hopkins is one of the easiest places in the world to get into research, whether it's as your essay option or just a general interest in research. I've walked into labs and gotten research in, in neuroscience, in neuroimitative architecture and more of a computer engineering thing. And even in my undergrad, I got a summer job by walking into a photonics lab and literally just asking if they needed somebody to do work. Um, I literally signed the paper the next day. On top of academic things, uh, campus is full of fascinating things to do. Um, we have Fall Fest and Spring Fair, one each semester that's basically large campus events with music and food, and everything kind of gets decked out around campus. Uh, events like Lighting of the Quads, where we set fireworks off on the upper quad. Every finals period, they put flamingos all over the engineering quad. I don't understand why, but I love it anyway. Um, and recently, we had a Diwali celebration as well. There's also clubs all around campus. Since I was an undergraduate, I've been involved in a fire spinning and juggling club. Um, there's a lot less odd clubs out there as well, but they're all really fun. They almost all allow in graduate students, unless they're, I guess, the sports teams don't, but all the clubs are very happy to take graduate students, teach you what they do. And then there's Baltimore in general. Baltimore is just an hour from DC, three hours from New York. It's really easy to do a day or a weekend trip to DC, New York, or Philadelphia. There's great food everywhere, and there's more opening every year. Um, it's been really cool over the last five years to see Baltimore really grow and gain a lot of cool new things. And a lot of the areas just kind of pop up restaurants and other things going on. Um, and that comes in, uh, there's a few major places people live. Um, Remington is just south of campus. It's really growing quickly. Uh, you can see our house there. It's like a uh, bougie cafeteria, I think is the phrase my friends use. And it has like six different startup restaurants that are all crammed into one space. Uh, Charles Village, which is where the Hopkins campus is actually located and where I live. You can walk straight to campus. The housing is affordable and you have some really cool colored row houses uh, on some of the alleys. And Hamden, which is just on the other side of campus, is a, I guess, hipstery neighborhood with tons of artistic and uh, restaurant stuff. And every Christmas, they light up an entire street with tons of decorations and Christmas lights and everything. And if you come here, I really suggest you see it. Uh, Baltimore also has a number of very large events. Uh, Artscape and something called Light City or giant arts festivals that happen every year. Hunfest is a, a festival about Baltimore as far as I can tell. Um, we recently finished the Baltimore Marathon. We have two major sports teams, the Orioles for baseball and the Ravens for football, um, who have, they've been doing well. 
They've been doing well. Okay, they, they've been doing well. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And with that, I'm going to pass it right back over to Noah. So the most natural question to ask uh, in uh, for, for somebody planning to apply to a graduate program is kind of what's the value proposition? What, what are you going to get out of this? Beyond that, of course, I mean, it's great to say I'm going to get a great education, and I, and I can attest to the fact that you will. But it's also good to know that you're going to be uh, plugged into a network of alumni. All these alumni aren't just from our master's program, which, as I mentioned, is relatively young. Uh, many of our master's pro students have gone on to these, some of these uh, organizations, but we have a long tradition, as I mentioned, of robotics and master's programs from our sister programs in mechanical engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, uh, as well as from our PhD program have uh, gone on to uh, many great uh, places over the years. You can see some of them listed here. I have a PhD student who is about to start her second interview at Intuitive Surgical, for example. And then there's a, a long list of places where our master's and PhD students uh, go. And then um, our PhD alumni have gone on to faculty positions at leading research programs uh, around the world, uh, many of whom are uh, listed here. And I should mention that after graduating, there are a number of options uh, for you to consider. We actually uh, end up recruiting a few master students every year to stay on for the PhD program uh, and or uh, help our students in applications to other PhD programs around the country and the world. And so there's that option. And the other option, of course, is to use this master's degree as a springboard to a higher level of uh, engineering uh, enterprise at a company. And so to date, all but one of our alumni have responded to a survey, and 100% of those that responded have um, either landed positions at, in PhD programs or in companies. So that's a pretty good success rate, I would say. And we're still trying to get the last one to write back to us. So he's probably too busy in his job. Now, what you need to do on the front end in order to be considered for uh, our program. So um, we're looking for candidates with proficiency in math and physics and computer programming and we recognize that everybody's going to have different strengths and weaknesses so for example if you're a computer scientist um, you're obviously going to have excellent computer programming skills but perhaps your knowledge of physics is not going to be as strong as somebody who's say a mechanical engineer which is basically an applied physics program right and so we do recognize this and but we're still looking for somebody with a balance of these skills and uh, our students Students usually come in with a bachelor's degree in uh, engineering science or math. In fact, I would say almost always uh, in engineering science or mathematics. And of course, you have to fill out the graduate application. You have to write a statement of purpose. The statement of purpose, I would say, is less important. You know, I, I'm interested, as, as one of the main people that reads these, I'm interested in your lifelong aspirations for robotics. That matters to me. But I'm also interested in seeing kind of practically speaking what it is about our program that you're interested in in particular so I believe that if you're applying to a master's program you're in robotics that you're interested in robotics in general but what is it about the Johns Hopkins program that's going to be uh, good, uh, important to you and this statement of purpose needn't be a five page dissertation really a one page statement of purpose that's sweet and short and sweet and to the point uh, is the most valuable for us in evaluating so this isn't something you need to belabor for months just write a, a short, concise statement of purpose that tells us why you want to come. And of course, a transcript. Uh, GRE is important uh, on our, I can't give a litmus test as to what our GRE quote unquote minimum is, but I will tell you that our applicants have very strong GRE scores, uh, particularly in the quantitative area. You can see the median uh, quantitative score for the fall 2017 class is 168. A weakness in your GRE um, is not something that's insurmountable. If you have a really strong uh, collegiate record with good scores in mathematics and just had a bad day on the day of the exam, that's something that we can definitely take into account. If you did score poorly on the GRE and have had math or advanced engineering professors that you, that you know that you impressed with their mathematics skills and can invite them to write letters for you, that can really help. So um, for international applicants, as I mentioned, we have people phoning in from all over the world. You do need to take a English proficiency test, and you can see that we do require you to have a, a sufficient level of proficiency with English because it wouldn't be a kindness 
to admit somebody to the program who wasn't able to understand the instructors and interact with their cohort. So it's really, this isn't because we want to keep people out, it's because we want to make sure we recruit people that can be successful. And so if this is some place where uh, you performed poorly, then um, it's some place that would give us uh, some pause in your application. So um, I recognize that the application fee of $75 is non-trivial. And so, uh, and I think that the, the real reason that this application fee exists is to make sure that you're really serious about this program and, and, um, uh, and you're selective in your applications to places that you think are gonna be the most, uh, the best fits for you. So um, you can find out more on the website that's listed there, lcsr.jhu.edu slash MSE admissions. Easy to find on the web if you um, lose track of it today. And with that, I'd like to open things up for uh, questions for uh, me and Andrew. And so I'm gonna click a little button here that allows me to view any questions that come in. There's a question, how should we start our personal statement? Is it okay to start with a story, et cetera? So let me just say that this is your personal statement and you need to, you can feel free to start it however you're comfortable starting it. If you wanna tell us a story or an anecdote, that's fine. I would say that keeping, this, keeping the story and the whole letter short and sweet is really helpful because I wanna be able to make sure that I, and the committee will wanna be able to make sure that they can really clearly understand what it is about the program that you want. And if, if that's buried in a very long dissertation, that's harder to, for us to pull out. You have to recognize that we're uh, reviewing hundreds of these. Um, and so when you put yourself in that perspective, and anytime you're applying for something actually, you should really put yourself in the perspective of the reviewer. You wanna make the information that they're really after easy to find. And this is a really great question I just got from one of the participants. Um, for somebody who has been out of school for a while, what types of references besides professors are recommended? This is an acad a technical academic program. And so I can't emphasize enough the importance of people that can technically evaluate your academic capability. There are a lot of projects and so forth, but there's also a very strong theoretical component. And so I would say um, your letters should be dominated by people that can evaluate your academic capability. Uh, that being said, if one of your letters came from something like a supervisor that saw you do um, uh, significant uh, projects uh, and so on that could certainly uh, add an important dimension to your application uh, because we are very much interested in people that have a strong practical side uh, but again we want to really make sure that that um, when we think about our evaluations we, we really don't think about who to keep out what we think about is who are the people that are gonna be able to be really successful in the program? So we're not trying to create a line to sort of make it super competitive for the purpose of making you competitive. And the one way we can evaluate that is if we see from your letters that you're really gonna be uh, prepared for the academic rigors of our program. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna take this one. Uh, it asks, can you explain how computer science students can benefit from a program? So as I said, my background was computer engineering. Uh, I'm filling out my advising sheet and I think 70 or so percent of my classes, which I guess would be seven out of the 10, uh, were in the computer science department. Um, if you're interested in machine cognition, machine perception, things like computer vision, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, it's a great way to grab all of the classes that both teach you the theoretical basis for these and a lot of the applications. So I took natural language processing classes, I took advanced computer vision classes, and then I was able to apply those in my other robotics classes on a real working system. So that's a lot of where computer science uh, uh, meets robotics and where that can be interesting. A specific technical question, if experience in EVs, I assume that's electric vehicles and electronics relevant to the program. Certainly, uh, this is good technical training. It's hard to say more than that without looking at it. I mean, as I mentioned before, I'm a double E by background and training, and I do robotics, so having a, a strong electronics EE foundation can be really good. And, and do you expect uh, students coming in to have prior research publication? Absolutely not. Certainly it would be an enhancement to your application to have one, but um, it's not something that we explicitly even look for. It would be something that would be seen as, a, as rounding out a particular application, but not something that we look for. What is the process like for somebody who wants to pursue a PhD at JHU? Great question. So if you know right now, as you sit there, that you wanna do a PhD, that's your end goal, I would 
advise you to apply for PhD programs. If you're not sure and you really want to have, and by the way, if you are in the PhD program in any of our departments, you can actually do your master's in robotics along the way. So if your interest right now is in a PhD, then I would recommend that you at least also apply directly for a PhD program. That all being said, if you decide not to apply for that or um, maybe uh, you know PhD programs, even very qualified candidates often don't get admitted because it's a matter of uh, how many spaces there are available in labs and so forth. You might say, well, you know, I really want to go to Hopkins, so I'm going to get a, uh, start with my master's. Then what would happen is you would come on campus, begin taking classes, and begin interacting with professors on campus, maybe start doing some research projects and so on. And if you are able to establish a strong working relationship with a faculty member and they're impressed by your work, then you can ask them if you can apply to the PhD program. And it's a fairly straightforward administrative switch, actually. PhDs, students, um, and I, I, a very natural question, and I'm sure this will come up, is, is one about funding. Our master's students are not funded. They are self-funded. They pay for the tuition. It's not cheap. Unfortunately, um, I think it's a good value, but it's not it's not inexpensive. If you are, were to be admitted to the PhD program, uh, obviously one can't pay tuition for five years um, while getting a PhD degree. The PhD program is a funded program. And so uh, uh, I have actually two students that, two recent students in my lab that started in a master's program. It happened to be the mechanical engineering master's program, but then then applied, that worked in my lab and then applied to the PhD program and I admitted them into my uh, lab. So um, it's a pretty, it can be a pretty smooth uh, process. And uh, there really aren't financial aid options available for master's students. I need to be clear about that. There, there can be some jobs that you can pick up while you're here, but they're not, they're not going to cover your tuition. Uh, I think that that can be a uh, an obstacle, perhaps an insurmountable obstacle for some for some people. Uh, but I just need to be really clear about that upfront. There really aren't um, significant resources available for such for such things. If you want to join the aerospace industry, how useful will a master's in robotics be? That's a really good question. I guess it would depend on the aspect of the aerospace industry that you were interested in. Um, I'm not an expert in the aerospace industry, so um, I, I feel a little bit um, like not the perfect person to address this question, but uh, certainly uh, aerospace has a large amount of uh, artificial intelligence, and if you're interested in uh, small aerial vehicles and so forth, uh, that's actually a significant, uh, we have one of the, a very strong lab here that does uh, uh, autonomous flight control. There are um, courses in the robotics program that you would be able to take. Uh, for example, there's a space dynamics control course that you can take from the mechanical engineering department that applies toward this program, and a lot of the math and so forth um, applies. We have uh, a satellite surgery project, um, surgery on satellites it's called, uh, which is a NASA-funded project for using the Da Vinci surgical system to do, uh, as the master, to do repairs on uh, space stations and so forth. So uh, that is a, a really cool uh, NASA funded project that is obviously directly related to the aerospace industry. Can you talk about the research going on in the perception group? You know, I, I actually, for specific research, I just highly recommend looking at, I mean, everybody's faculty profile is online and you can see a wide range of work. Uh, I can point you to specific people to go check out. In the perception group, there's um, Professor Alan Yule in computer science, who's a, a Bloomberg distinguished professor. Uh, who's doing uh, work in uh, deep learning and computer vision. There are, um, uh, you know, Greg Hager, Renee Vidal. There's a wide range of faculty that you should just go check out um, and uh, check out their own research profiles. Is it encouraged to contact professors before applications to see if they're taking students? Well, that would really be a question for, I mean, that's a good question. There are, there, it's perfectly reasonable to contact faculty. I would say you shouldn't be discouraged if they don't reply. Um, once you're admitted to the program, then a follow-up email to any faculty that you're interested in would be really good. Hey, I was just admitted to the master's program. I'm really excited. Do you have any research openings in your lab? That really is a very different conversation to have. We have to recognize, unfortunately, I probably receive about 10 such emails a day this time of year. And I, I can't reasonably and, and deeply investigate and reply to every one of them. Um, and so 
Uh, and I think the same goes for a lot of faculty members. So it's certainly perfectly okay to reach out. And if you're admitted, then that's a really great time to reach out. I have a background in chemistry. Is that a large disadvantage? Um, that's a really good question. It, it looks like you have some, some uh, math and, and physics training. Uh, that's a hard one for me to answer without taking a look at your transcript. It would depend on uh, how much you know, computer software training you had combined with, uh, you say only up to Calc 3 is your training. Uh, that's a really tough one to ask, but certainly it's a physical science. You're going to have a good understanding of modeling and dynamics. So there's a good chance that you would be just fine depending on, you know, other factors that I don't really have access to right now. So another que uh, question from somebody with a chemistry background, a chemical engineer, are there prerequisite courses for students coming in from other backgrounds in the, in the bachelor's in chemical engineering? Well, one course that I recommend that every student take before matriculating is Gilbert Strang's MIT Online Open Coursewares Linear Algebra course. And this is something you can just log in, watch the videos, and do the homework assignments so that you come in having a mastery of linear algebra. And linear algebra is, I would say, second to none in terms of uh, its relevance to engineering as a mathematical discipline. And understanding matrix theory at a, at a level that is put forth in that course will greatly simplify your life for the first few weeks of any of our courses when you're suddenly uh, bombarded with matrix theory concepts at a level the likes of which you had never seen. So I highly recommend all of my matriculating ma uh, master's advisees to take Gilbert Strang's MIT online open courseware's course in linear algebra. He, he does mean that. I mean, his course currently in the first few weeks are just high level linear algebra. Yeah. And then once we you get past well. that, yeah, and once we get past that, then we can actually get down to the uh, brass tacks and, and do some real robotics. But unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, robotics is a discipline that requires uh, advanced math skills to do well. So a really good question. How good at computer science do you need to be I'm going to paraphrase this. How good a computer science do you need to be to enter our program? We have lots of students that are bread and butter mechanical engineers that have little more than extensive MATLAB programming experience, that, that don't know C and C++, don't know Python, and so on. That is a challenge for them, but it's, not, it's certainly not a deal breaker. Um, I would say that uh, if you feel that your computer science is a little bit rusty, but your math chops are really strong, then you can breeze through Gilbert Strang's online open courseware and then pick up a book in C or C++. Um, there's lots of freely available compilers and so on and begin giving yourself some experience in um, programming. Even if you don't come to our, our master's program, programming is an essential skill for the practicing engineer and you'll benefit greatly from doing that irrespective of whether or not you come to our program. But we don't have like a CS bar that you have to cross in order to get into our program. Uh, so I'm going to take this one about uh, do students get research or teaching assistantships? Um, I don't think master's students tend to get research assistantships um, unless... Occasionally they can get paid positions, but rarely will they cover the full yeah. tuition. Um, um, as far as teaching assistantships, again, it's not going to cover tuition. Uh, to give you an idea, I have TA'd uh, one, two, currently three courses a semester. Um, just to earn some extra money. I highly suggest never TAing three courses at a time. I don't sleep anymore, but I have TA courses both in the business department and currently in the computer science department. I TA a machine learning course. So yes, you can do that. And speaking of internships, more importantly, one of the things that we really work hard with our students to do, and while we can't like guarantee placement in an internship, many, many, many of our master's students do, re do um, uh, internships at companies over the summer between the first and second year. And so this is a, um, another avenue to get a little bit of money, but I think more importantly, get a foothold in industry at a higher level than you can do fresh out of your master's, um, fresh out of your bachelor's, excuse me, uh, and uh, both get a foothold and get some experience in industry. And many students that do that often end up successfully applying to the companies where they did their internships uh, because the, uh, that company then had an opportunity to just see how, how well trained they were uh, from our master's program. Okay, so a good question. I'm interested in two tracks, control and dynamics and medical robotics. Does the program give enough flexibility to manage such interests? Well, you certainly can't complete all the requirements of two tracks, but you do have two free electives 
that you can take and place, and up to actually four if you do a, if you do the all coursework track. So there is plenty of flexibility to um, I have to double check the exact course numbers, but there is plenty of flexibility if you complete one track to take a couple of courses from another track. Uh, the other option is to um, work with your advisor to craft your own course selections more with a more general set of courses available through the general robotics track. Um, and so that provides an opportunity for somebody who really has a diverse set of interests and wants to, wants to maximize flexibility. There's a question here about, uh, can we explain, explain broadly the areas or fields they work in in companies, people who uh, come from, it says Johns Hopkins, but I assume the master's program here. Uh, a number of my friends have gone to work at defense contractors to do uh, research in quadcopters, uh, somebody's working on a hover bike. So a lot of engineering and uh, R&D positions. Additionally, I actually know somebody who went on to a more sales-like position and uh, somebody who went to a more, I don't know what to say, other than a Swiss Army knife of a company type position. So there's a lot of different options. May I ask what the nationalities of the current students are? We have students from all over the world, including, of course, the United States, but um, we have a large number of students from, I think, our, our second largest can, so we have a lot of we have a lot of U.S. applicants, a lot of U.S. students, um, many of whom are ones that have stayed from the for the five year BS MSE program. So the undergraduates at Hopkins have an opportunity to apply to one of several master's programs, uh, including robotics, and we call it the five year BS MSE, um, meaning that they are able that the ones that apply are able to finish in one year, but that's because they're able to kind of benefit from having already been at Hopkins, take a few extra courses in advance and so on. They don't all manage to stay. Some of them take a year and a half, that's fine, um, but it's that's an option. So if you hear that term, BSMSE, five-year BSMSE, or five-year master's, that's what it refers to. But uh, of our students that apply externally, we have local, I would say, even though the United States is big, local students from the United States, but we also have students from India, China, uh, all over Europe. So there's uh, people that apply from all over the world uh, and come here. There's certainly no um, no limits there. A good question. Does does the previous year wait list hold any weight? That's a great question. So uh, I would say that you should mention that in your application. But when you do, try to identify what you have done in the year intervening to enhance your application. You know, what extra courses have you taken? What other preparation have you done? Um, because this can really help us kind of understand where things were. So I, I don't want to say one way or the other it has more weight, but it's certainly worth mentioning. And I think in particular, if you can identify really concrete measures that you've taken to improve your academic uh, capabilities uh, between last year and this, that would be really helpful to us. I want to bring today's webinar to a close. And I want to uh, invite you to uh, follow up with us if you have further questions and as well to take the opportunity to really Dig, dive deeper into our online information and advising manual and so on so you can learn more about the program. But if there's something you can't find or you're having trouble tracking down a piece of information, of course, feel free to reach out with us. And um, so I thank you. Thank you guys very much. Okay.